In this last lecture, I want to look at Jesus and the sign of Jonah, because in Matthew uh, and uh, Luke, when the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, and the crowds asked Jesus for a sign, Jesus replied that the only sign that will be given is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, Jonah is the only prophet that Jesus compares himself to. And because this was the only specific sign that Jesus promised, and because he himself compared himself to Jonah, I think it's important that we understand the depth of the sign of Jonah. So, I'll first read the Matthew account in Matthew 12, verses 38 uh, through 41, uh, and then the Luke account. Matthew 12, it says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now in Matthew 16, verse 4, Jesus also said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. The other more lengthy account is in Luke 11, verses 29 through 32, which says, As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them, because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, Luke 11, verse 30, seems to identify the person of Jonah as the sign to the Ninevites, and to indicate that in some parallel fashion, the person of the Son of Man, Jesus, will be the sign to the current generation. Matthew 12, verse 40, connects the sign of Jonah with the burial of Jonah in the belly of the fish. Uh, uh, The parallel now is to the death and resurrection of the Son of Man. Also, in both Luke 11, verse 32, and Matthew 12, verse 41, it is the proclamation of Jonah that is deemed significant. Um, Now, Luke and Matthew agree that only the sign of uh, Jonah will be the only sign given, and they both seem to presume the inevitable condemnation of the generation that receives it. Um, In Matthew 16, verse 4, the sign of Jonah is left undefined. But the indication from these passages of the person, the proclamation, and the death and resurrection uh, between Jesus and Jonah Uh, indicates the depth of the sign of Jonah. And so let's take a look at this. There's more to the sign of Jonah than just the three days uh, and three nights in in the uh, belly of the fish and the three days before Jesus uh, resurrected. First, so let's look, look deeper. There's an identification with Galilee. Now, Jesus was brought up uh, in the town of Nazareth in Galilee. In John 7, verse 52, the chief priests and the Pharisees specifically attacked the idea that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, and they told Nicodemus, You're not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. The Pharisees were wrong. There was one prophet who came from Galilee, and that was Jonah. Jonah was from the town of Gath-Hafer, according to 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And Gath Hafer, ironically, is a small village about three miles northeast of Nazareth in Galilee. Secondly, there's an identification with the dove. 
The name Jonah means dove, a symbol of peace. Christ is the Prince of Peace, and he made peace by the death, by his death on the cross. And furthermore, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and rested on Jesus as a sign that he was the Messiah. Now, let's take a look at Jonah's being swallowed by the fish and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, there's several parallels here that go beyond simply the three days. And that's the three days is what most people, when they think of the sign of Jonah, think of. And that's true. But as I say, there's this parallel is much deeper and more detailed, which is why Jesus uh, you know, said the only sign will be the sign of Jonah. First, look at the parallels, the storm at sea. In Jonah 1 and 2, uh, uh, Jonah boards a boat headed in the opposite direction from where he was supposed to go. But uh, in Matthew 8, Mark 4, and in Luke 8, Jesus sets off in a boat towards the other side uh, of the lake, leaving the crowd uh, that presses, behind, presses on him behind. Now, both accounts involve movement from Jewish to Gentile territory. Um, Jonah In Jonah, the, the ship was seized by a mighty wind uh, and uh, it was a tempest, and the ship was almost, uh, they were afraid it was going to be broken. In Matthew 8, verses 23 through 27, Christ likewise was aboard a ship in a similar situation. There was a great tempest on the sea. The ship was covered with the waves. Now Jonah lay down in the ship and fell asleep while the mariners were cried out in fear and they cried out every man to his God. In the same way, Christ lay down in the, in the back of the uh, sh uh, boat and fell asleep until his disciples woke him saying, Christ, uh, Lord, save us, we perish. Now, uh, then uh, it goes on to say that in Jonah, we read that when uh, Jonah said, throw me over, and when he did, uh, it says, the sea ceased her raging. In Jesus, or in, in Mark, Christ rebuked the wind, and it says, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Um, and then, in Jonah 1, verse 16, it says, when the storm ceased, it says, and the men feared a great fear. Similarly, in Mark 4, verse 41, it literally says, they feared a great fear. But because uh, great, uh, Jesus is greater than Jonah, there are contrasts. Um, in Jonah's account, he was weary of God's service. Jesus was weary in God's service. Uh, and Jesus did what Jonah could not do. Jesus rebuked the sea, um, and, uh, or rebuked the wind, and the sea was calm. Also, Self-sacrifice. Um, the sign of Jonah involves more than the three days in the fish. Um, it also involves a sacrificial death. Jonah offered himself up uh, in Jonah 1 verse 12. He said, uh, Jonah said to the sailors, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. Um, now, and then it says in uh, Jonah 2, verse 2, he descended into the belly of Sheol. Um, and literally, uh, although in uh, chapter 2, verse 7, in my uh, translation it says, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Actually, uh, the Hebrew says, his life ebbed away. Uh, and uh, so, but... Look at, of course, Jesus. Um, and, and by the way, in uh, Jonah 1, verse 14, it says, uh, they, uh, they called on the Lord, and they prayed, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Well, Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus offered himself up. Um, he uh, died on the cross, and 
uh, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As we've said in earlier lectures, that indicates, and the darkness of the sky indicates, he was experiencing hell itself, far more than just Sheol. But, like, uh, so the sailors said, they call, they admitted that, uh, Jonah, uh, uh, that Jonah was innocent blood. Judas admitted in Matthew 27, 4, that he had betrayed innocent blood. And the centurion who crucified Jesus said, certainly this man was innocent. Um, now, Jesus, of course, is greater than Jonah. Um, Jesus would not abandon sinful humanity, um, uh, uh, but voluntarily gave himself uh, for us. Whereas the cause of the storm, in Jonah's case, was Jonah himself, his disobeying God. Jesus always obeyed the Father. Um, and so, in Jesus' case, it is our sin who causes the tempest and storm of God's wrath and judgment. But Jesus voluntarily sacrificed himself for us. And so, Timothy Keller summarizes by saying how ironic it is that in Mark 4, the disciples ask, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? They believe he's going to sleep on them in their hour of greatest need. Actually, it's the other way around. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they went to sleep on him, and they truly abandoned him. And yet he loves them to the end. You see, Jonah was thrown overboard for his own sin. But Jesus is thrown into the ultimate storm for our sin. Jesus was able to save the disciples from the storm because he was thrown into the ultimate storm. But then look at the descent into Sheol. Now, Sheol is not the Hebrew term for the underworld as such. It's, uh, the term is reserved for those who are under divine judgment. And that means that Jonah's use of the word Sheol in Jonah 2 verse 2 indicates uh, that he is under Yahweh's judgment because it says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. Um, but in Matthew 12, verse 40, the primary meaning of the sign of uh, Jonah is the correspondence between Jonah's descent into Sheol and our Lord's experience of death, especially when he is driven from the Father's presence, uh, when the Father abandoned him, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and so what we see here is that Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jonah was three days in the belly of a fish um, and uh, descended you know, in, in a literal kind of place. But he, uh, he said into Sheol, he was under God's judgment. But Jesus was three days and three nights uh, in the heart of the earth. And in the book, I talk about how that's really referring to Sheol and being, uh, it's more than just the burial. It's being under God's judgment. But Jesus actually experienced that judgment, the judgment of hell itself. Um, and uh, because of our sin. But then look at the resurrection. Um, now, the resurrection is God's great sign to Israel. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, a Jewish sermon from the first century refers to Jonah's emergence from the fish as both a sign of rebirth and a sign of truth. Um, and so to the extent that he uh, understood uh, understood himself to have been in Sheol, his deliverance is also viewed as a resurrection. Um, in fact, there is a widespread Jewish tradition that Jonah is the widow's son who was raised by Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Now, one first century uh, writing says, Elijah raised Jonah from death, for he wanted to show him that it is not possible to run away from God. And so all of this provides the backdrop uh, for what we find in Matthew's Gospel, 
that Jonah's temporary stay in the belly of the fish is an, an analogy, a prophetic analogy for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, that should have been the only sign that Israel requires. But, of course, the people, even when uh, you know they tried to kill Jesus, but then later on, the people in Jerusalem were confronted with the promised sign of Jonah, namely that Jesus had risen from the dead. And at one point, he appeared to 500 people, but they do not respond with repentance, as the Ninevites did, but uh, instead they uh, only increased their opposition to the will and ways of God. Um, and so, in his resurrection, Jesus again demonstrates that he is greater than Jonah. Jonah was not literally raised from the dead, or if he actually had died in the fish, he was only revived uh, and lived only to die again. Jesus suffered real physical death and spiritual death in hell and was truly resurrected to life again, from which he will never die. And uh, because Jesus is the first fruits of those who are asleep, he will bring resurrection to all who are in him. Now, the three days and three nights. Um, the fact is that Jesus was buried on Friday evening and rose early on Sunday morning. This does not contradict the reference to three days and three nights, because that phrase is an idiom. Josh McDowell writes that um, the Babylonian Talmud, Jewish commentaries, relates that the portion of a day is the whole of it. And the Jerusalem Talmud, which was written in Jerusalem, says, we have a teaching, a day and a night are an ona, and the portion of an ona is as the whole of it. In other words, in Jewish reckoning, a partial day is considered as a full day. So Jesus was in the grave Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So that counts as the three days, or to use the idiomatic form, three days and three nights. Um, and uh, I talk a little more about that in the book. But a couple of other things. Look at the person of Jonah. Luke 11.30 says, Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Now, that verse indicates that Jonah himself, the person, oh, is the sign. Um, now, why is that? There's, a, 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 a again, a great parallel between Jonah and Jesus. Other prophets denounced ungodliness and pronounced judgment on pagan nations in addition to Israel. But Jonah is the only Hebrew prophet who is said to have traveled abroad to denounce in person the wickedness of a foreign nation and to proclaim its overthrow. Now, uh, Jesus, likewise, left his home in heaven and came to earth. His coming had been foretold. And the fact that he had come from God, you know, was authenticated by his life. And so, Jesus left the peace and safety and love of heaven to go to a foreign land where he was rejected by his own people, where even his own people wanted to kill him. That's a direct parallel between, uh, where, where basically, where people are enemies of God. That is parallel with uh, Jonah going to the Ninevites, who were the enemies of Israel. Um, so, but again, look at the difference. Jonah did not so love the Ninevites that he gave them God. Rather, God so loved the Ninevites that he gave them Jonah. But, as with Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have uh, everlasting life. You see, Jonah did not go there voluntarily because he hated the Ninevites, as we learn at the end of the book of Jonah. Jesus voluntarily came to earth because he loves us. And finally, let's take a look at the proclamation. On his face, Jonah's proclamation to Nineveh, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown, was an unqualified message of judgment. Nevertheless, Jonah recognized that implicit in that message was a message was a call to repent and a call to mercy. Jesus never required a second call. He came uh, and explicitly urging repentance and proclaiming God's 
grace and salvation. Mark 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, the theme of judgment in Jesus' message was implicit. The, so it's the same ideas, but Jesus, the message of God's grace and salvation, is explicit. Judgment is implicit. With Jonah, it's just the opposite. Judgment was explicit, but uh, the call to repentance was implicit. Um, so, when in at the end of Jesus' time on earth, in Matthew 23 uh, and elsewhere, uh, he called on judgment on Israel. Then it became explicit. So just as Jonah said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So Jesus, when he said, not one stone of this temple is going to be left on top of the other. That was fulfilled 40 years later. Jesus was saying, by implication, yet 40 years and Jerusalem will be overthrown. Um, so, you see, but Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus alone offers both grace and new life, or judgment, depending upon one's acceptance or rejection of him. Um, and the life, of course, that Jesus offers, which Jonah never could, is eternal life. So, what is the relevance of this to us today? The sign of Jonah reveals God's and Christ's concern for both Jews and Gentiles, because Jonah went to a Gentile land. Um, and so, God was telling Jonah, and through the book of Jonah, us, God does not play favorites. Um, he loves people, as Revelation 5 verse 9 says, out of every tribe, tongue, nation, and people in the entire world. Now, Jesus, like Jonah, was a Jew. But he comes for people of all kinds, all tribes, all nations. Um, and God gave the Gentiles repentance uh, in, in Nineveh. So Jesus commissioned his disciples, us, to go to all the nations uh, and call people everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. Now, that mission continues today, and it will continue until Jesus Christ comes again. Um, so, and the reason is because, again, he doesn't play favorites. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 15 and 16, Jesus' mission was that in himself he might make the two, Jew and Gentile, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having it put by having put to death the in, enmity between people of different tribes and nations and the enmity between people and God Jonah couldn't do that uh, he was uh, a disobedient uh, prophet but ultimately God got his attention and he conveyed the message that he was told to convey. Jesus was more than that. He's God and man, but he came to earth knowing that people would oppose him and would kill him. But he brought the message of reconciliation anyway. Uh, and these many parallels between the life of Jonah and the life of Jesus are instructive for us. Uh, and now we are called to carry on the message of Jesus Namely, repent and believe the gospel because God loves us and he has done everything for us to guarantee our salvation. So that is Jesus and the sign of Jonah. It is very, it, yes, it includes the three days before the resurrection, but it is much deeper than that. And so let me conclude, this is the final lecture on biblical theology. Let me conclude again by saying what we see here in these details, Jonah's place of birth, the sign of the dove, his person, his message, um, the, the proclamation, and the three days and three nights, um, all show a depth of detail um, that has been built into the Bible that is all true. 
that was all pointing to Jesus Christ. The Bible is unlike any other book that's ever been written or ever could be written. It was written over a span of about 1,500 years by 40 different authors from different countries, from different stations in life, and yet it is telling one coherent message. It all hangs together. And the one who is the main subject, who causes the book to cohere, to not contradict itself, to have this one message, is Jesus Christ. There's nothing else like it in the entire world. There's no one else like Jesus in the entire world. And I hope through these lectures on biblical theology, you will be in awe, in awe of God, in awe of Christ, in awe of the Bible, in awe of God's plan. You will see the depth and riches. That is why. Turn to him. Study his word. Take it deep within you. Because as we do that, the Holy Spirit will work through his word to change us so that we become more like Jesus. His values become ours. His priorities become ours. We start thinking like Jesus thought, speaking like he spoke, acting like he acted, so that people will see that Jesus is alive. He changes lives. And when we do that, we will be, as the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 29, conformed to the image of Christ. That is the point of our lives. And through studying the Bible, that's the point of the Bible. It's showing us Christ so that we can be conformed to his image. Thank you.